Hello, everyone. What a great speech we just heard by Abby Roth. Thank you, Abby. Um, my name is Therese Corsell. I am in my first year of law school at Catholic <laughs> University, and I am so honored to introduce Kristen Hawkins. Kristen is a Christian wife, mother, grassroots activist, author, speaker, podcast host, human rights advocate, and president of Students for Life. In 2006, she launched Students for Life's full-time operation. Since then, she has built up a small organization made up of just a few dozen student groups scattered across the country to a coordinated national team serving more than 1,200 Students for Life chapters in all 50 states. Kristen has always been a favorite speaker at the Loose Center events such as this summit. She hosts a weekly podcast called Explicitly Pro-Life, which you can find on iTunes or YouTube. A frequent speaker at college campuses like Harvard, Dartmouth, UC Berkeley, and media analyst, Kristen's, Kristen's expertise includes abortion, feminism, disability advocacy, and healthcare, as she navigates the social conditions and public policy that impacts the human rights issues of our day. She does all of this while multitasking as a mother of four children, two of whom have cystic fibrosis. Kristen knows firsthand that all children have value no matter the perception of their abilities, and works daily to be a voice for millennials and Generation Z who recognize the horrors of abortion for both women and their preborn infants. Kristen Hawkins is an incredible champion for fighting for life. Please join me in welcoming her. All right, so I've got lots of devices today. Such is life. Oh, praise Jesus. It's, it's charging. I do want to apologize to the two ladies who walked in on me changing in the bathroom who are very embarrassed. You know who you are. I won't call you out. But as you can see, this is the life of uh, a traveling mom and uh, nonprofit owner. Um, this is what happens, has to happen sometimes. Uh, I want to thank you guys for coming today. I'm really excited to be with you all, and I'm so excited to see so many of you who are involved with the Claire Booth Loose Institute. This is such an important uh, organization and such an important time in our nation for you specifically to be involved. Um, you know, I launched uh, Students for Life 16 years ago. I know I look like I just graduated college, but... It's not really the case. Um, when I meet with older people, they think I just graduated so college. So it doesn't, doesn't matter. You all can completely tell that I, I'm no longer in my 20s. I, I launched Student to Life, though, as, um, as a post-row organization for our pro-life movement, knowing that um, we would see the end of Roe versus Wade in our lifetime. And when that moment came, we would need a trained army. Um, trained in all 50 states, uh, leaders who would be ready to go to their capitals uh, to fight to make abortion an uh, unthinkable and unavailable option. And I remember not long after launching Students for Life, we were at a swanky uh, event, a fundraising event for Students for Life at the Harvard Club in Manhattan. Um, I'm pretty sure we'll never be invited back to the Harvard Club ever again uh, because we brought our defunct Planned Parenthood uh, pink minivan or 15-passenger bus and parked out front just so everyone knew we were there. Um, so I'll definitely never be allowed to host another event there. Um, but I remember after the event, it went flawlessly. Eric Metaxas was there. We honored a U.S. senator. It was so exciting that we had, like, made it this fancy event. Um, and I had a mentor, though, take me aside after the event and said, you know, this was great. I loved everyone's passion, seeing all the young people who were out there. However, if you're going to be successful with Students for Life, if you're going to convince the investors to, to give their savings to you to complete this mission, you may want to stop saying things like abolish abortion or when Roe versus Wade is going to be reversed because it sounds, it just sounds impossible. And who's going to take seriously a leader in the movement who actually believes these things are possible? Um, 
More than a decade later, I am uh, so glad I did not listen to my mentor's advice. He's still my mentor, but I'm really glad I didn't take his advice uh, on this instance. From Friday, June 24th, I was honored to be the person standing at the podium the moment the decision came down. Our vice president, Tina, handed me her phone and said, just start reading. And before the world and all the TV cameras that pressed in, uh, I was able to read, the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion. Roe and Casey are overruled. And I said more things, but no one can hear it because everyone was screaming, cheering, crying. The pro-life generation who is beside us, uh, behind us, and those who advocate for abortion who were um, a little bit farther beside us in between uh, my bodyguards and myself. It was a major triumph for sure. And, and I've heard folks say that it was you know, the biggest political upset in our lifetime. Um, but I... I want you to know that I don't see that moment, that that moment, those few minutes at the Supreme Court as you know, my victory. For I believe it's right now, um, that's the moment I was made for. In the words of St. Joan of Arc, I was born for this. And you were born for this moment. And the proof is, you know, everywhere we look, everywhere we look, we see the proof of this. Today, there's more than 1,300 Students for Life groups in all 50 states, more than 150,000 trained young people. On any given day, we know there are hundreds of Students for Life leaders on their campuses doing what we do best, reaching those most targeted by the abortion industry, educating them, converting them, changing their minds, and activating, activating them, getting them to to take a bumper sticker and put it on their laptop or to join a club meeting or to volunteer at the pregnancy center. And this movement is committed. No matter rain, snow, sunshine, uh, we are there and we've been there for 50 years and we will continue to be there. Um, but it took extraordinary work to get to this spot. It took extraordinary work to build and launch and sustain the pro-life generation, which is now, my words, gleefully giving nightmares to the writers of the New York Times and Washington Post and other mainstream media outlets who simply keep writing articles that they cannot believe that there are so many of us. Um, it took extraordinary work for us to get here. I. I don't know if you know this, but I was in a major movie this month. No one knows because it was a documentary. It was only a limited release. But I was in movie theaters this month. Uh, and a pro, we allowed a pro-abortion uh, producer to follow myself and two other leaders around in the pro-life movement for two years. And, you know, uh, the producer, it's, a, it's like the most fair piece you could probably get from someone who thinks that I'm a threat to democracy. Uh, it's pretty good, though. Uh, I told my parents, they were like, I don't believe you. I was like, I'm in the movies. And that was after I was already in your all's calendar. And like, they thought that was a big deal because I was like a calendar girl. Like, this is the crazy stuff that happens in the pro-life movement. Um, but the articles have been written since this documentary, Battlegrounds, been released, have been so insightful that the producer admitted that she didn't really believe us when we told her the pro-life generation was here, that the pro-life generation was the active army of the pro-life movement, and that it was being led by young women. And in all the interviews she's giving to NPR and the Daily Beast and Yahoo and Hollywood Reporter, all these places that don't really like to have somebody like me on, um, she's just repeating our talking points, that this is the pro-life generation, that young women reject the lies of the abortion industry. It's, it's a lot of fun to watch it happening right now. But we didn't get to this moment without radical sacrifices. Radical sacrifices that were made by so many, by those who were making them before I was even thought of, before I was conceived, before I was born. We call them the original, the OG pro-life gen. Those who in 1973, when seven men handed down Roe v. Wade, refused silence, refused to stop talking about abortion. Women like my hero, Phyllis Shafley. I mean, you could never tell Phyllis anything she didn't want to hear. Oh, it was fierce. 
for the investors who pledge their retirements and, you know, their savings dreams instead of going on vacation, giving sacrificially for decades to the pro-life movement, to pregnancy centers, maternity homes, adoption agencies, pro-life advocacy organizations, even when every poll said we were losing this issue for the thousands who've showed up every single year for the annual pro-life march, which is the world's largest social movement demonstration. No other movement in the history of the world turns out more people every single year than the pro-life movement. And I think personally, and I think you can probably um, uh, play into this, personally, the sacrifices that so many of us have had to make, the sacrifices I've had to make, the 15-hour days and sleeping at my office one night a week on my little Ikea love seat. I don't fit on it anymore. Thankfully, I don't have to do that anymore. The, the hours and days I've missed of my children growing up, the time away, the sacrifices that each of us have had to make. I mean, there was a couple of years in my two oldest children's lives that I don't really remember that much because I was sleeping four hours a night and getting up and leaving at 5 a.m. and coming back at midnight from work. That was my life for four years. Being here today, changing in a hotel bathroom, the glorious life that I have. The sacrifices that you all have to make on campus. I've been uh, closely monitoring um, some campuses where, you know, University of Alabama, there's now a change.org petition uh, to remove TPUSA and Students for Life from campus because we're just too radical. The threats, the death threats that some of you all may have received, or more importantly, as women, uh, we hear this a lot, the rape threats that we receive. Um, from being pro-life, from being outspokenly pro-life. These threats are increasing. It's scary at times for, for many of us. It's caused many of us to actually have to employ full-time security guards now in our headquarters when we travel. I told them to take a break for today because I figured you guys would be pretty good, so I won't have to worry about it. Two years ago, though, um, anticipating that Roe is going to fall. There were about 21 cases making their way up Supreme Court. Donald Trump was living up you know, to his promises. We, we knew the folks that he had appointed to Supreme Court. Um, we could really see the writing on the wall for Roe versus Wade. I got a lot of, you told me so, text messages the day Roe fell. You said Roe was gonna fall, I didn't believe you. It's bleak me, people. Um, but two years ago, we knew this was going to happen. And so my husband and I intentionally made a radical decision for ourselves. We didn't want mom to go back to pre-COVID traveling, being away from our four children for three or four days a week. Um, I also wanted to have the ability to quickly pivot and um, to be wherever I was needed in a post row America, whatever state legislative battle we were facing at the moment. Um, so we made a very radical decision. Uh, we sold our home, uh, our brand new home, uh, and much to the displeasure of my parents and you know some of my uh, friends I grew up with who you know think I'm depriving my children of a normal life of uh, drag queen story hour and TikTok videos. Uh, we moved into our fifth wheel camper that we didn't know what to do with, but we were going to learn. Uh, and so six of us live in 425 square feet uh, and we have three puppies. I added on additional puppy this summer. Uh, Rosie, she's cute. Um, it was a radical decision that we made for our family. Um, and for, for us, we kind of view America as like this open road to explore, to be able to show our children firsthand God's greatness and the majesty that he created with America. We live in an amazingly beautiful country. To teach our children firsthand and have them see firsthand the history that so many in our country have, have long forgotten. Um, it's very confusing for people when I come to events like this because folks will ask me, where did you come from? Where do you live? Basic questions that I don't really ever have great answers for. I can tell you where I'm at right now. I can tell you maybe where I'll be next month. But after that, I don't really know where I'm from. Um, 
And for us, we just kind of choose. And I'm the navigator, so I get to do most of the choosing, which is, you know, fun. It's basically where we, where the pro-life movement needs us most, where the history lesson is we want to teach our children. And I was thinking about this and trying to plan out our spring travels. I think it's going to be in New England because we haven't done enough Revolutionary War uh, stuff. So stay tuned for that speech. I'll talk about that later. Um, but I was thinking about this open road, and I think that's where we are right now in the pro-life movement. To God's glory, we find ourselves in a brand new era. There is literally no roadmap for the journey we are on. I've been reading every book I can about uh, the suffrage movement, uh, civil rights movement, various social movements, where they went at specific points. There is no handbook for where we go. This is where we are in the pro-life movement. It is an open road for us to explore. I think the roadmap will certainly be shaped by the elections this coming Tuesday, but I think we can all agree that cultural transformation um, is a long road <laughs> to take. It's, it, and when I say long road, I'm thinking like Maine to Alaska with all four kids and three puppies and our uh, dually uh, Chevy truck. That's a very long trip, let me tell you. On campuses and online, we have to reach this generation, particularly Gen Z. Our goal at Students' Life this year is to have a million conversations with Gen Z. This is a generation that has never known an America without legal abortion. And we have to help quell the fear, the fear that you all are probably seeing in your conversations. I've certainly been seeing it on campuses this semester, rebutting the misinformation that's spreading like wildfire out there. You know, it's just a little tip. There is not one piece of pro-life legislation. There is not one pro-life organization. There is not one pro-life leader that has ever advocated that a woman who's experiencing a life-threatening pregnancy uh, illness ectopic pregnancy or something of the sort, that she should be forced to die. That's just not true. And by the way, having a miscarriage, a, national, a natural miscarriage, while medically it's called a spontaneous abortion, that is not an elective abortion or a direct abortion. It is absolutely disgusting that the abortion lobby is trying to gaslight the millions of American women who suffer the pain of natural miscarriage to convince them that they had an abortion and they too should be conscripted into this pro-abortion movement. It's so frustrating. You have to be there having these conversations online, on campus, saying that is not what the pro-life movement stands for. Do not fall for the predatory lies of the abortion industry, those who profit from the despair of so many. In our communities, we have to do a better job of showing her that we care more, that if the pro-life movement, no woman stands alone. A year and a half ago, I told you, I've been preparing for this day for like 16 years, so I've thought about it a lot. A year and a half ago, Students for Life launched our campaign for abortion-free cities. And the idea was to find a way to do something more, more than the praying in front of the abortion facility, the sidewalk advocacy, very important, more than just what we do on campus, having conversations, but getting out to communities and actually changing culture, changing the poll numbers. So we started door knocking. In the past year and a half, we've knocked on 120,000 doors in 20 neighborhoods surrounding an abortion facility. The conversation usually starts out with like, hey, I'm not here to talk about a politician. Guard drops. I'm here to talk about abortion. Guard back up. And then sometimes I have to scurry off the lawn. I've literally been chased off lawns before. Um, some people on our team are a little bit more suave about it. They don't bring up abortion until like the third question. I usually lead with it. But the idea of, of that personal approach is to ask the community member, do they know of any nonviolent resources in their community that will help a woman who's chosen life to see through her pregnancy and beyond? 
And we have a little list, a little chart of the few services that Planned Parenthood provides versus all of the services that the pregnancy help center in their neighborhood and the maternity home in their neighborhood provides. And we have this conversation because we know we have a kind of a bad damage brand in the pro-life movement, but people think of pro-life. They think of old white men yelling at women in front of abortion facility. That's not who we are. The Battleground documentary, which I am in, in movie theaters nationwide, select movie theaters nationwide, proves to you that. Um, but we have to do more. We have to show them. So we're going to literally go to their door and say, hey, I'm pro-life. Have you known about any of these resources? And the sad fact is, guys, 75% of the neighbors that we converse with do not know and they've never heard of a pregnancy resource center. We have nearly 3,000 pregnancy resource centers and maternity homes that vastly outnumber the fewer than 600 abortion facilities in our country, but no one knows about them. That's one of our biggest challenges in the pro-life movement on this road to abolishing abortion. In our state houses and on Capitol Hill, we have to first ensure that Planned Parenthood is defunded. We're going to see a, a massive push. Planned Parenthood can go fund themselves as far as I'm concerned. And yes, that is the nicest thing I can say about Planned Parenthood. We'll see a massive push for this after Tuesday when the GOP takes over the House. We don't know about the Senate results, but the House is looking pretty good. We're going to make President Biden choose whether or not he funds things like, I don't know, the DOD or his friends at Planned Parenthood. And this needs to happen in states across our country. Planned Parenthood's latest national uh, annual report came out in September. They always release their annual reports at like terrible times. Usually it's like Friday before New Year's Eve. And it's been a year delayed. They finally released it the Friday after Queen Elizabeth died. So nobody was paying attention. Everyone was talking about Queen Elizabeth. Like they literally hold it and wait for something bad to happen. And they're like, oh, now we dropped the report. Because they don't want anyone ever to know what's in their annual report. What did their annual report prove? They got more than 600 million taxpayer funds, more money this year, and committed the most abortions they've ever committed and increased the percentage of abortions they commit. They now commit more than 40% of all abortions in our country today. They have to be defunded. The second thing we've got to do is we have to hold our leaders accountable to do more than simply pass a law that... Uh, prevents abortions at 15 weeks or more. Those laws are important. They save lives, but they save far too few lives. According to the CDC, that's 11 to 20,000 children a year. A heartbeat law, which polls, by the way, the same as a fetal pain law, can save 60 to 75% of all children destined to die from abortion. We have to hold our leaders accountable and make them do the things they don't want to do, which is hard things. I know everyone's going to be so happy about Tuesday. You're going to hear me going out there going, you have to do more. It's my job. Someone recently mentioned to one of my staff members, like, oh, you work for that lady who's never satisfied. I, like, want to find this person because I'm like, that should be on my bio. The person who's never satisfied, the woman. The third thing we've got to do in our state houses and Capitol Hill, and by the way, there's only two genders. Um, it's like the most controversial thing you can ever say. Uh, the third thing we have to do in state houses and Capitol Hill is we have to tackle the very real threat of chemical abortion pills. How many of you all know about chemical abortion pills? Have you ever heard about them? Good, because like two years ago, that number wasn't that high. In a recent Washington Post article, uh, journalist Caroline Ketchner exposed an illegal abortion pill cartel in Mexico. They're shipping drugs to girls, to women in America, in red and blue states. It doesn't matter what state you live in. With no doctor's examination, no actual phone conversation because of the language barrier, no ensuring that she doesn't have... Um, She's not RH negative, meaning if she has the abortion and doesn't get the Rogan shot, she'll never be able to bear children again. No question of what her blood type is. No ultrasound to make sure she's not experiencing a life-threatening ectopic pregnancy. None. They're just simply shipping women two pills. Oh, and by the way, a little packet of acid to help dissolve the baby's body. 
This is in the Washington Post. I'm going to read for you just one part of the, this article. Turn on the bath, Monica said as she yelled out to him. I need to get in there. She felt a flood of liquid in her underwear and stepped into the bath with her clothes. Lying in a tub, she f- said she felt some pressure release. Then she screamed. The fetus was floating in the water. Smaller than her palm, the fetus had a head, hands, and legs, defined finger and toes. That was in the Washington Post. The Washington Post, two weeks ago. Seeing a dead baby floating in your bathtub and being told to use the packet of acid to dissolve their body before you flush them down the toilet is the definition of women's empowerment, not only for the abortion movement, not only for the feminist movement, but now entirely the the whole left of the politics in our country. But it's so clearly the opposite It's the opposite of empowerment. And while you all are disgusted and mainstream media and mainstream America is disgusted by this account, how many of y'all heard the NPR airing of an abortion this week in Michigan? Y'all heard that? Where the girl repeatedly says, I can't do this, and the abortionist continues to coax her and tell her, yep, you can, you're going to do it. Which I would say would be a problem in most things. Because, you know, I was in for a medical procedure at my OBGYN's office this week, and he said, as soon as it hurts, you tell me, and I stop. That's what a doctor is supposed to do. That's not what was happening. And this was aired on NPR as some sort of sick justification for abortion. It's disgusting. America's ruling class is bending over backwards to portray these experiences in a positive light and gaslight all of us into believing, all of us who know the devastation that abortion has caused because we all know someone who has probably been party to an abortion or maybe our, ourselves, we've had abortions. We all know it's not a good, it's not easy. We know women deserve better than this. We know men deserve better than this. And we know for sure that innocent children deserve more than to be starved and suctioned and poisoned and dismembered and then their body dissolved and flushed down to down the toilet like they never existed. Ladies, I understand your roadmap to helping us achieve an America where abortion is abolished, getting us to our ultimate goal, that destination of abortion, unthinkable and unavailable. Your roadmap, your way to get there may be a little different than mine. But the point is you have several open roads in front of you that you can choose to join us in this journey. But no, in order to reach this destination, which there is no playbook for, There is no map. We're literally, like Christopher Columbus, making the map. Had to throw that in there. But in order to get to that destination, you're going to have to choose to do radical things. You can't just continue to do what you did before in an America with Roe versus Wade. It's not going to be enough. We've seen how they've been fighting just these past few months, bitterly holding on. What was it? Barack Obama said Republicans bitterly held on to the God's guns and was it religion or something like that? You know, God's guns, babies. They're, they're desperately holding on to the scalpel and to the sc- suction tube. That's what they're doing. And we're going to see on Tuesday that abortion not only ends babies' lives, it also ends politicians' careers. But we have to do more. So you need to be unafraid. Unafraid on campus, online, at the state house, in your community, no matter where your conservative activism takes you, to speak truth about the violence of abortion and the extremism, the extremism of those who promote it. Today, tomorrow, and the next day, You're going to be called to do this. And you can't 
give in to your fear or allow a weaponized DOJ or threats from anonymous people on Instagram or Twitter to hold you back from this important work. You have to be unafraid. You also have to be innovative and refuse to rest, even when your state becomes abortion-free. Because as I just described, deadly chemical abortion drugs are going to every state across our country. Administration, hospitals, VA hospitals, thanks to President Biden, in red states, committing abortions. These new challenges and the dogged determination of the abortion industry to literally stop at nothing. I mean, they're so far gone, they think airing the sound of an abortion is going to help them. This dogged determination means you have to be committed to advancing a culture of life. Demands that you act and you do it quickly and with innovation, you do it with grit, you try new things, you try new ways to always reach people, to start the conversation, to change minds, to activate on your campus. In a couple of months, Students for Life's gonna debut a, well, I love Dave Matthews band, so there's a song, Don't Drink the Water. So the video will have Dave Matthews, and he's a raging pro-abortion person, so I can't wait to hear from his lawyers. I will cease and desist after I have a meeting with Dave Matthews to convert him. But we're gonna have a Would You Drink the Water challenge, and we're gonna, be educating students on campuses about the chemicals that are in our water because of chemical abortion drugs. And that how scientific studies are proving that animals are having a higher miscarriage rate because of some of these drugs, depending on those who are more located to water treatment plants. I know it sounds crazy and sounds off the wall, but it is true. I'm gonna become a human rights and a water rights activist. In the same month. Never thought that. My dad won't believe me, but me I'll be back in the, mag the uh, calendar and then we'll get excited again. But you have to try new things. You have to be innovative, find new ways to talk about the violence of abortion because you have to face it. No one really ever wants to talk about abortion except like every Democrat running for U.S. Senate. But other than that, no one really ever wants to talk about this issue. It doesn't matter how Americans identify the labels they give themselves, pro-life or pro-choice. The top of the mind polling shows that the top words that people hear in their head when they hear the word abortion is death, killing, sadness. Death, killing, sadness. That's why when Joe Biden gave his like 17 minute speech this July, I don't know if y'all remember, he, in the middle of like a weekday, it was like a Friday, he gave a 17 minute speech about abortion. He trotted out this horrific story of a woman, a girl who was raped at 10 years old, who was trafficked across state lines for abortion by her mother, who was raped by an illegal immigrant who I think was the boyfriend of the mother. He talked for 17 minutes about abortion and how horrific it was that the Supreme Court reversed Roe versus Wade and how people like me are a threat to democracy and the man never used the word abortion. He also never talked about the rapist and had the rapist been caught, had the, was the girl safe? He never talked about that. He used her story. He used the horror of rape to justify an extremist position that 100% of babies in the womb must die if their mothers deem it convenient to them. But he never said the word abortion. Why didn't he say the word abortion? Because they know no one likes to say the word abortion. No one likes it. So find innovative, creative ways to get abortion talked about. This is why you're here. You're making friends, because sometimes you're not going to make friends on campus saying this. But you have friends now, so you're good. Be willing to hope. I think this is the hardest thing. This is the hardest action I'm going to give you. I'm only giving you three. Be willing to hope. To envision a nation where we reach the destination, where abortion is unavailable, where it is unthinkable, and hold on to that hope in the peaks and the valleys of this journey, because we all know such a long fight is, long journey is not going to come without setbacks. Hold on to that hope and be undeterred in your goal. It's simple sports psychology. Winners always envision the win. In my family's um, journey in the past two years, 
We've certainly seen our fair share of unexpected things come up. One of my children received a very rare neurological diagnosis that's going to impact his ability to walk. We've had tire blowouts, uh, brakes fail. That was scary. Um, my husband and I have a pretty calm marriage, have had some explosive fights trying to back our house into campgrounds at 9 o'clock at night in the rain. Um, I'm in the back. I don't have a walkie-talkie, so, of course, I'm yelling from here to that gentleman uh, what to do. And I don't actually know how to back up a camper, so I don't really know what I'm saying either. I just know if there's a pole or a tree. Uh, he's usually always right. There's only been, like, one time I can remember that I was right. We've had things come up, but we have a commitment to each other and to our family to continue on to the next state, to the next national park or the next national historic landmark. In the pro-life movement, there's going to be bumps in the road, but we can't get stalled alongside the road. The road is ours. That's what's so great about this moment. The road is open for us. We just got our licenses, people. We can go. And this is, a, this is a playing field. This is a, this is a moment that we can win on because the question in our national media narrative is it if we should protect pre-born children's lives from the violence of abortion, the question, the discussion in our states is when. That's not something they can win upon. But you're not always going to be able to go 90 in the left lane with the top down. You're going to be like us in the right lane, especially in Florida, avoiding all the Florida drivers. I don't know if you've ever driven here. It's freaking crazy. I've driven all over the country. It's nuts here. So sometimes we're going to have to get in the right lane. We're going to have to slow down. Sometimes we're going to have to stop. And I know you're all ladies, so this isn't hard for you. We're going to have to ask somebody for directions and maybe have a conversation with somebody else about where we should go. We may have to get a new tire put on along the way. But the point is, we can't stop. We can't stop moving forward to, so we can reach that destination. You know, one of the biggest lessons I learned this past year, uh, we were here in Florida for the winter, along with the entire Midwest. Um, we were here. Um, and, you know, it was great. We got kicked out of some campgrounds because we weren't old enough, because apparently they have, like, not age restrictions. you got to be, like, so old to get into the campground. Felt like I identified as 55, but it apparently doesn't work that way. Um, but we left Florida and we headed to Texas uh, for some engagement, speaking engagements I had on campuses. And we kind of did some pit stops along the way in the, in the South, places where my husband, my kids, and really myself, I've only kind of gone in and out of. I was like, get me in and out as fast as possible. There's big bugs down there. Um, but it was... It was fascinating as we stopped. We particularly stayed a few weeks in Mississippi. Um, there was so much history everywhere we looked. I mean, we had conversation after conversation about the tragedy and the horrific nature of slavery, the Civil War, the Reconstruction era, Jim Crow. I had a lot of conversations with my children. And it, I think it was, for us, what was really poignant was the moment thinking of, just the abject failure of, of reconstruction in our country. That it took 99 years from the end of the Civil War until the signing of the Civil Rights Act. 99 years. It's devastating. And when I, I think about, you know, Roe being reversed, and I was getting calls and interviews as soon as the Dobbs decision was leaked in May, I couldn't help but think about that decision that kind of road trip we had taken through Mississippi and through Alabama and really think about reconstruction because this is the moment we're in. We're trying to put together what seven men broke in 1973. And I think a lot about how long it took, the challenges along the way to get our nation to the point of signing the Civil Rights Act. You know, I... It's, it's a hard thing. You know, we've taken our kids to Gettysburg and Vicksburg and Appomattox. But we also took them to the Civil Rights Museum this year. We took them to the Civil Rights Museum in Jackson, Mississippi. And it's a hard thing having to explain to your seven-year-old daughter what the white robe means and why it looks so scary and why it scares so many still in our nation. To have to explain why 
Some people were treated as less than simply because of the color of their skin. Because kids don't get it, right? They're like, why? Why, mom, why? It was just sad. It was sad to have to explain that. But then I, but then I got the opportunity to take my kids to some really incredible places where a few, a radical few, stood up and refused the status quo any longer. We um, went to Greensboro, North Carolina, and stood behind the lunch counter that four college students on a Sunday morning refused to vacate. We went to Detroit. I don't know how it ends up in Detroit. We went to Detroit, actually, at the Henry Ford Museum and sat in the, in the seat, and the bus that Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat for a white man. This spring, we're going to travel, um, I don't know when, but sometime after we leave Florida, we're going to travel to Birmingham, where Martin Luther King wrote words from a jail cell in solitary confinement that inspired so many more, millions more, I would add, to act radically. He wrote, I have almost reached the most regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block and stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner but the white moderate, who's more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. He further went on um, to talk about the church and the lack of the church's response to the atrocities that were happening in the South. And I, I want to share with you, because I know we're not all Christian here, but I think as a conservative movement, we can relate to this. He said, there was a time when the church was very powerful. It was during that period that early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not, was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and the principles of popular opinion. It was the thermostat that transformed the mores of society. I think today the question for you ladies is what roads are you going to choose in this long journey to abolish abortion? Will we be and will you be simply a thermometer or will you be a thermostat? Or in road trip terms, will you be the person driving and navigating or the one sitting at home liking the pictures of the journey on Instagram? Tragically, it took 100 years from the end of the Civil War to the signing of Appomattox, to the signing of the Civil Rights Act to get us closer to what Martin Luther King called that positive peace. It took the murder of a little boy in rural Mississippi named Emmett, his murder's acquittal, to one woman refusing to give up her seat, to college students refusing to get up from the lunch counter, to bus freedom rides, to days and weeks in jail, to stinging water hose pain, to death threats, to bombings, to assassination, 99 years. 99 years to get to that point. The moment we have labor for, the moment that those in the original pro-life genocide have labor for is now here. And the road before us is going to be long, but it, we can get to that destination. But we have to be unafraid. We have to be innovative. We have to be willing to hope. We have to choose the radical path. Those radical roads that are going to lead us to positive peace in our communities and churches, on campuses, on Capitol Hill, in our state houses, to fight the chemical abortion cartel, to fight the fear-mongering that we're seeing, to fight the lack of awareness. And you ladies of the conservative movement, are going to have to be the ones to lead it. Does anyone have questions? My flight was delayed, so I can be here all day, but I know you guys have other people, but. So, sorry, um, two questions yep. here. The first one being, you kind of mentioned these illegal drugs that are causing abortions to come over the border. What are some things that can be done about that? And then no. my second question is, I feel like for most people who really feel like this is an issue and really care, obviously, like we all do, there's some, like, turning point of where, like, yeah, it's important, but then it becomes really important. And so I'm curious what that turning point was for you that made this such an important issue in your life. 
Okay. So I'll answer the last one first. Uh, the turning point for me, I think, was volunteering at a pregnancy center um, and getting firsthand being able to meet women who had had abortions um, but were still coming to the center, who were still living with the abusive boyfriend, who were still living in poverty, to kind of see firsthand that abortion never solved her crime, solved the crimes that were committed against her. Did it make her life better? It only prolonged her suffering. Um, and that it led her right back into the doors of the pregnancy center that she had been in before. I think that's a really important realization that all the talking points that we hear, the justifications for why we need abortion, um, don't actually ever end those crises in her life. Uh, and I think for me also seeing the pictures of children who had been uh, killed via saline abortion, um, I think, you know, once you kind of see those pictures, um, I, I, I think it's really hard to turn back. I think you have to kind of like the pro-life movement before you see those pictures, because I think sometimes if people see those pictures and they don't really like pro-lifers, it's easy for them to discount those pictures. And we've seen that in research we've done at Students for Life, where conservatives see pictures of abortion victims and get angry at abortion, where liberals see the pictures and get angry at the people holding the pictures. Don't ask me why liberals are so messed up. I'm just saying that's what the study was, it proves. Um, and so I think once you kind of get somebody far enough along to like listen to you and realize, wow, the pro-life movement really isn't just about enslaving women and you know making everyone wear those uh, ridiculous red outfits. Um, I think I think those images are very powerful. Uh, what can we do in chemical abortion? We're going to be very creative. I've got an entire legal team at Students for Life working on this. Um, I think where, where you're going to see, like I was mentioning before, um, we're going to really attack it from the water uh, and environmental issues um, and allowing states to take action to protect their waterways uh, and to protect their livestock from these dangerous pills. Uh, you also just like need to like elect pro-lifers uh, who will put pro-lifers into the FDA, who will, um, you know, uphold basic common decency with protecting pregnant women um, uh, from, from these predatory abortion practices. There's also really already a, a law in the books uh, that bans uh, the mailing of abortion-related material from like the 1800s. No one's enforcing that, but it's actually technically illegal to mail anything about that uh, in the mail. There's also questions about the disposal of, of human remains. Uh, you, if you are having suffering a natural miscarriage and you go into an emergency room, if you do not get a DNC completed, uh, they will give you a red bag catch kit to when you go home and you pass your child because the you're not supposed to ever put human remains uh, in our open waterways. Um, and so I think actually that's something that's very interesting, especially for, you know, one easy regulation would be, well, if you're going to kill children, you should at least require women to have to collect their child and bring their child back to you for proper disposal of that child so you're not polluting waterways, which just that law in itself won't, may not stop uh, chemical abortions, but it'll certainly stop, you know, abortionists from being able to like ship drugs from out of state they would have to have a location in state. Also telling a woman she has to collect the remains of her child will be, um, I think really pivotal in changing a lot of women's minds. So yeah, there's a lot of kind of creative ideas like that. Question? Uh, you, so going back to the chemical abortions again, mm -hmm. that affected the water and specifically yep. animals. Yep. Okay, well, how does that affect our water? Yeah. I don't think I'll ever eat freshwater fish ever again. Only ocean fish for me after re researching it. So would you, was that, like, has there been that yeah. research on that? There has. You can go, um, I actually have some in my purse. It's a little disorganized, but you can Google endocrine disruptors in public water. That's what they'll call them. And so we, we know this is like a research thing. that There are endocrine disruptors in public waterways. Uh, we've been foying water um, boards in Florida, Tennessee, and our states. What we have found is while they tested the water for COVID, uh, they've never tested the water for these abortion drugs. Um, so I, I actually think it's going to be I'm like, shouldn't tell you all this because it's going to be public in a couple months, but I think it'll be a pretty big deal. We're going to challenge PETA to join us to protect the animals. And then I'll go and have a burger at Five Guys after. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, I 
I am a boy of Jewish descent, and I would say that. Yep. There, and if, um, this was yeah, can you just go back and fix your state? That would be great. Oh, yeah. uh, we're trying. So it basically just removes every abortion law yep. that happens. Um, if that passes, what are the next steps for mm. the movement in Michigan? No. And how do you find people who are state optimistic, I guess, with such a radical? I think when that passes, I think a lot of people, and the way it's written is very, um, I mean, on purpose, they write these to be very vague. I think the first thing the pro-life movement needs to do is start an education campaign about what they've done, about what the law states, because that will be vastly unpopular with the majority of Michiganders, right? And we already know that. The problem is, if they don't hear about it from us, um, if you if you talk to a pro abortion lobbyist in Michigan, it's like a no big deal. It just you know, no no doctors don't even have to perform abortions in Michigan. Anyone will be able to perform. I mean, it's like crazy. It's like California level. Um, so I think when the bad thing happens, you start exposing it. I mean, that's what we saw, for example, in um, you know the Kansas defeat. And there's a lot of different reasons why the Kansas amendment this summer uh, failed. Um, but I think one of the things that you know, I've kind of been telling folks is like, after all this hubbub dies down, we'll be able to go back and pass it. It just, you will have all of Hollywood like going in. And I think that's what it is right now. You have a governor and like once Tudor Dixon wins and Gretchen Whitmer is out of pocket, it'll be a different day. Hi, thank you so much for your time. Hi. You mentioned me doing the book and I was just wondering what is some present practical day-to-day encouragement that you have for yourself that you can share with us to stay grounded and encouraged in this world that we're fighting for safety? I mean, you all. I get like a first-hand glimpse every day of the amazing work that you guys do and the conversations that you're having and the minds that you're changing. And like, I don't know, I stalk the pro-life movement on Instagram. That's all else on my Instagram is students for life groups. Um, and so I get to see every day students posting diaper drives and support drives for pregnant and parenting students on campus or changing a policy or we changed a mind or we got a death threat or all of our sidewalk chalk was just erased and we're still back out doing it. Like, I get firsthand to witness you and your continued courage in doing it. And I think that is what fills me up. I think like the thing that sinks my ship is like the internal politics or dealing with other pro-lifers most of the time. That makes me like sad. Um, but I like fills me up when people protest and they come out and protest me. I love it. Those are like the best speeches I ever give um, because Obviously, we've been able to penetrate campus enough to start a discussion and, you know, 10 people want to come out and scream and yell at me. That's a really great day for me. That's very exciting. Um, that means pro-choice or, you know, movable middle folks will come and be like, what's this all about? I want to hear it. They'll be sitting in the audience. It won't just be an audience of, like, pro-lifers who have come because whatever. Um, then I know I have the opportunity. So I don't know. I look for like hope in like weird places. Like the more protesters I get, the more angry people get. Just like the mention of my name, like at Clemson in two weeks, I they call me yesterday and have increased all my security because like they're going crazy. I'm like that's incredible because like I'm just like a normal mom. Like I'm not a scary person at all. Um, but the fact that they've already started all of this like controversy just because like I'm a threat to like civil society, like my mere presence. Um, it's, it, I don't know, that fills me up. That makes me happy. It makes me giggle. So. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, this is all so great. Thank you for everything you reached. And I noticed that you said you were not doing marketing in general for the years. Mm -hmm. What techniques do you use and how can we as politicians get to that point more often than others? Yeah. Just, I am not the per best person to dialogue with one-on-one -on -one because I've been told you can read my face like a book. So if I think you're a moron, even if I don't say it, my face displays it. I have much better people on our team. We actually measure on our team uh, minds change rates. So we we're averaging like a 10% minds change rate on campus a semester, 25% online. I'm a, I'm a numbers person. 
So I am not the best person. I can tell you what they do that's really good, okay? I'm much better at, like, people screaming at me and me just using, like, science and logic and then putting it on Instagram and inspiring other people to do it. That, everyone has their own path in a post row America. That's the lesson. Um, the thing we know is every single person you have to assume when you're having that dialogue, that conversation, has a personal experience with abortion. So people want to tell you how they feel. They want to tell you their story. I know way too much about way too many people in America um, because people just will tell me things, birth stories, births that have gone wrong or painful and lots of stuff. Um, so I think it's important to let them tell you where they stand on the issue. Um, we like to ask questions and, and say, well, did I hear you right? You just said this, but let me ask you, how do you feel about that? And then you try, try to kind of start having those kind of like questions because they'll catch on pretty quick of like, oh, can't, you know, can't say that. You know, they say that, you know, every human has uh, a right to health care and be like, what types of humans are you talking about? You know, um, you can always you can always kind of get them to the point of like the main point in the pro-life movement, the main point in the pro-life movement and every conversation that you have with someone, it doesn't matter how it starts out is always going to come down to the fundamental question of what is it? What is it? Because if it's nothing, if it's a blob of tissue, then like you don't need any justification for abortion. If it's just like having your appendix removed, who cares? But if it is something, then we need to have a discussion about that. And every conversation, whether it, the person starts talking to you about rape or they talk to you about uh, too many children in foster care who are suffering in foster care, or if they're talking to you about a child who is in utero and you know the diagnosis is that, that child's not going to survive very long outside a womb, it always comes down to the question of what, who are we talking about? What are we talking about? And so as a pro-life activist and advocate, you're always trying to get that person and your questions to get them to that discussion of, well, what is it? Science tells us it's a unique, whole living human being that's unrepeatable, that's never existed before and will never exist again. That's biology. Bio science and biology also tell us it has to be a human being because I can't reproduce a koala bear. I want a koala bear. I have three puppies. I keep trying to look for a puppy that looks like a koala bear, but I can't make a koala bear. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many times I have sex. It doesn't matter who I have sex with. Like I would, it's only my husband. I would only <laughs> reproduce a human. So we, we already know it's living because cells reproducing and growing are alive. Dead things don't grow in a coordinated fashion. We already know it's a human because life begets life, law of biogenesis. Now, does that living human have value like you and I? So every time you're, you need to get them down to that point. Um, you can, sometimes people like to try out the toddler and they'll say, well, um, I hear your concerns about the poor woman who's in an abusive relationship that doesn't have her college degree or high school diploma. What about, what about if that child's two years old? And they'll be like, I never said that. I'm just saying. What if she has a two-year-old instead of a child in, in utero? Would you say that abortion, killing, ending life is justified excuse in that case? And every single person you'll ever meet, well, there's always one, would say, no, that, that killing a two-year-old is not justified. Great. You and I agree. Why is killing a two-year-old not justified? Because it's a human. Exactly. Just like the preborn. So, oh, are, are you saying that your humanness, that your right to life depends on certain conditions, like your location or your size or your level of ability or how you were conceived? Because if you start doing those things, scary things happen throughout history when we start saying certain people aren't full persons, and that you need something plus. Does that help you at all? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, guys.